Thank you. We have um, Duke going to say some words about the Disability Resource Center yeah. and what, what they do, disability services they provide, and share a little bit of, of his story as well. Okay. I did not bring PowerPoints. They'll love you. Thank I you. know. <laughs> They'll love you. Turn around here. Bounce my chair on this stuff. There we go. I'm good. Thanks. Good. There we go. Okay. Well, once again, my name is Duke Pettit. Um, I'm a graduate of UK uh, with an undergraduate in political science and a master's degree in uh, rehabilitation counseling. Um, I came to UK shortly after I was honorably discharged from the military. I spent 10 years with the uh, United States Army. Uh, I carried MOS's 62B and 63B, which is light, heavy uh, equipment mechanic as well as construction. Um, I spent one year overseas and uh, in Iraq, uh, 0203. Um, I was what I would consider probably career oriented to the military. Like I said, I spent 10 years in. I had my packet uh, set ready to go to officers uh, or for warrant officer school. Um, and approximately 30 days before my second deployment uh, to Iraq, I was involved in a single car accident going to my duty station at 7 15 in the morning on June the 9th of 2008. And that was what pretty much changed my life. I uh, did not walk away from that one. Um, I ended up with a C6 uh, complete spinal cord injury that rendered me a quadriplegic. Going through a lot of the stuff, what uh, Colonel Dawson here was talking about, I lost who I was. Uh, going through all the transition uh, uh, issues that veterans go through, I can just, uh, as he was doing, I was just taking them down. Been there, been there, been there. Um, I identified uh, myself as being a sergeant, as being uh, a technician, someone who worked on anything between a Humvee and an M1 tank. And I thought I was pretty good at what I did. So when I lost that component of my life, I lost who I was. I was no longer, uh, even as a father, you know, I wanted my children to see me as that soldier, as that technician as that person in uniform so even with the loss of my ability i lost all idea who i was my persona was gone uh, so i can really identify that not even as transitioning out of the uniform into civilian life i was transitioning from an able-bodied soldier not coming into the civilian world as an able-bodied individual but as someone who, in all actuality, my persona was a broken individual who was really not worth anything anymore. So my transition was rediscovering a purpose in my life and, you know, trying to identify what part of society that I could even occupy, you know, much less being a benefit to society at large any longer because I thought I was serving society and those around me by being in uniform. Without that, who was I to begin with? Who, just who was I? So my transition was a transition of rediscovery, of finding value within myself and something that that can once again benefit others. You had you once in service we regardless of the incentive that we do join we do join because we do want to serve in some capacity of someone or something greater than ourselves so that is sort of where i was in my transition fortunately i had a lot of support um it took me about a year to figure out how to ask for help um you know whether it be what type of financial assistance could i do to come back to school because there was a realization relatively early on that if I were to, if I was to be able to assist those at some capacity, I knew that I would have to come back to school. Uh, I had left school when I was 20 years old and I never returned. So I knew that education was going to be a necessity for me uh, in my transition strategy. So. Where do you go? You go to your VA benefit specialist. So that's where you went off to. Um, 
like uh, Colonel Dawson had mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of emphasis put through transition once you get out. And I had very little, if any, transition help when it comes down to dealing with the psychological um, needs that I was going through. I'm not saying they weren't there, but once again, you should be strong enough to do this on your own. Get your stuff together, get your head off straight and get your, you know, and get with the mission. So, but eventually it was there. I was fortunate enough to come back to UK. Uh, UK was always, has been a very welcoming source of support in my life. Um, I came, like I said, in 2010, shortly after my injury and I stayed. You know, I guess they weren't tired of me yet. I got my undergraduate, I said, in political science, then I got my master's degree. And within a month of getting my master's degree, UK hired me. They offered me a, an opportunity to actually continue what inevitably turned out to be, you know, not my destiny, but it gave me the opportunity to now help others um, in my capacity as an accommodation consultant. I am now given the privilege to work with students from all walks of life, whether they be civilian or whether they be our veterans, you know, coming in with what, whatever, whatever issue or trouble they're trying to work through, I'm honored to be there to offer them another layer of support as they continue their education or as they're trying to find their way in a civilian world. Because once again, whether you are a disabled veteran or a veteran without a disability, you are all going, we're all going to go through some level of those transitions, whether it be the isolation, which we all kind of feel coming out, uh, the loss of, you know, the loss of authority or the loss of just a regiment, a regime. That was one of my biggest things was you had someone telling you what to do. I was a sergeant. I felt good at the sergeant, but then you have your staff sergeant, and then you have your first sergeant, your master sergeant, it's just all up there. And then you have the officer corps and they're always looking for something for you to do. That's why you always want to look busy. So, <laughs> so, but now, but now working as an accommodation consultant, I'm able to continue my service working once again, like I said, with students with disabilities those students who need just another layer of support to help them realize that they have a spot, that they have the ability to attain their aspirations, their goals. And I think that sometimes they will let their own disability get in their way to where they do not feel that they can accomplish, but they can with the right level of support. And once again, we're just another layer of support for them. We don't offer them help. You know, we're not there to do anything for them. We're there to give them the tools and the assistance that they can once again develop those, their own strategies, their own ways to implement those strategies so they can recognize their dreams. And once again, I'm very honored to be able to do that. UK has given me a, you know, vital opportunity to continue my service to those that I once served, you know, the watchers in the night. Now I'm once again on the front lines, helping others realize their potential because I was in a dark place for about a year. I didn't realize I, I had no potential to realize, but through support, through encouragement, you go from thinking you're a broken human being into someone that has redefined themselves, who is now, you know, a, I do not think of myself any less as a father in a wheelchair than I did when I was wearing the uniform. I don't think of myself any less of a man or a human for that matter than I did when I was in the uniform. I was able to redefine myself through support that I received and now whatever I can do to help others realize their potential. So that's my transition story. Thank you, Appreciate it. I'm glad I don't have to follow this guy. <laughs> Finally, it's about to start now. <laughs> we, we have one final presenter today, and it's Matthew Bradford. Um, invited Matthew Bradford because we've been talking about student veterans today, but we haven't really heard from a student veteran. So we're going to hear from a student veteran at the University of Kentucky. 
um, invited Matt to share some of his story and just to share his experience of being a student veteran at the University of Kentucky. Matthew. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. You've heard from the Colonel. You've heard from Duke. That's a fun time. All right. I'm <laughs> writing up the day by sharing you all a little bit about my story, my injuries. And yes, I said injuries because that's the brightest side of my life. And that's who I am today and who I'll always be for the rest of my life, unless there's some magic pill out there that grow my legs back. But I got magic legs, and I love my magic legs. And if you want to um, know what my eyes looked like before, you can look at my daughter's eyes, that's my pretty blue eyes right there in her body. But uh, my name is Matthew Bradford. I served seven years in the Marine Corps from 2005 to 2012. The ultimate reason why I joined the military wasn't because I, you know, the family was poor or I wanted to, you know, couldn't go to college. It's because there's two towers that terrorists flew planes in and I, on September 11, 2001. I wanted to get the enemy back. I wanted to defend my country and I wanted to serve as many, quickly as I could possibly could. You know, now, almost 10 years later, or a little over 10 years later now, I can say many great <laughs> things on why I joined the Marine Corps, but at the time, Marine Corps infantry, they'll send you right over. And I joined September of 2005, and by September 2006, I was in Iraq, and I was getting shot at. Um, you know, of course, it's a lot different than what you see on a video game. There's no pause or restart. It's the real deal. Those people are trying to kill you, so your ultimate goal is to go out with 12 guys and come home with 12 guys. I am not a traditional college student. I'm a 30-year-old, unfortunately. Um, I was severely injured in January 18, 2007, when I stepped on a roadside bomb. I lost both my legs, my vision, multiple injuries to my body, and I was placed in a coma for three weeks. And I was also 20 years old at that, when that time. I wasn't even old enough to enjoy, um, legally, alcohol beverages. But... Uh, you know, my whole point of joining the Marine Corps was 20 years, see where it goes, deploy as many times as I possibly could. Now here I am laying in a hospital bed with tubes on every part of my body trying to survive. Um, you know, I, depression kicked in. I'm not in Iraq. I found out in the United States. I'm not with my brothers. That's where I, they killed me the most. And then they told me I lost my legs. I didn't, I didn't care at all about loss, losing vision. I wanted my legs to grow back. You see it on TV all the time. You hear news stories. You never really imagined that could happen to you. And here I am laying in a hospital bed that big because I didn't want to eat. I wouldn't eat because I wanted to die. I didn't want to live no more. Um, I had wonderful, wonderful nurses and Marine Corps personnel that worked in Bethesda that would come in and talk to me day in and day out. And, and actually, my first meal when I was in the hospital was a brownie and milk. From the, I don't know, it wasn't that brownie, but from then on, I just started eating. And then, I, you know, the one thing that made me realize is, you know, I, I could do, like, I love the Marine Corps. I got hurt at an early age, and my ultimate goal now is to stay in the Marine Corps. The guy that helped me out, I, I realized, I was like, I, I could do his job. I want to stay in the Marine Corps, and I want to help out other wounded warriors, you know, battling the same injuries I am, and, you know, we'll, we'll you know, talk them through it. We'll hang out, because he talked to me like a friend. He didn't talk to me like an injured Marine. Um, that I got hurt on January 20. I was in Bethesda, January 21st, 2007. I was out of there by March 21st. So once I got out of the depression state, I picked up my rehab. I ate, you know, pills were starting to be, uh, I wasn't taking as many pills anymore. I moved on to a polytrauma center. Therapy kicked in and I just, I exceeded. I just moved as fast as I could with therapy. Went to San Antonio received my legs and I was up on my legs by June 29th, 2007. So only five months after I got severely injured where they didn't think I'd live. And at that time I was one of the worst injuries in Iraq. Um, here I am walking. My ultimate goal at that time was to let me figure out my legs. Let me learn how to walk before I deal with the vision loss. The, uh, the, the battalion commander, company commander of the hospital at that time for the Marine Corps set me down and asked me, what do I want to do with my life? And I told him, I want to stay in the Marine Corps. What do I need to do? And he pointed out all these things in my mind, or all these things from how am I going to get around mobility-wise? How am I going to learn, like, get on the computer? How am I going to do all this stuff, take care of myself if I want to stay in? So I went to the blind school for six months, and I learned everything I possibly could, from the computer and independent mobility to building a birdhouse without losing fingers. 
because I did use a table saw. And uh, but that was uh, you know, and from then on, I got back. I was around some of the some of the greatest heroes of my life. I was in San Antonio as the burn center. So I was going to therapy, not only with amputees, but I was going to therapy with people that's burned over 50% of their body. And hearing how they re reacted, how they, you know, loved life, joked around. It's like, what do I got to complain about? I've lost my legs and my vision. Who cares? These people are going to be battling with surgery for the rest of their lives. They're burned, but they're having the best of life. And, uh, you know, and, I, and then I also learned down there, it's, if you don't, if you don't learn to make fun of yourself, then you're never going to survive. So I love to throw jokes out about myself, about my legs and my vision. And sometimes you could, you, you tell, you say it to the wrong person or to some people they don't understand and they just think you're an idiot. But, uh, but it, you know, it's something that I really learned to do. And, um, you know, once I started walking and once I figured out the blindness, my ultimate goal from now on, let's get out and let's, let's do everything I need to do to reenlist. I put in my paperwork in August of 2009, and on this day, 2010, I re-enlisted, and I was the first blind WMT in the history of the Marine Corps to do that, and that was probably one of the, at that time, one of the best days. Now it's one of the greatest days because today is also my anniversary, Amanda. You want to give a shout out, huh? <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then they, they, they sent me to the Wounded War Battalion East in Camp Lejeune, where yeah. what I started in 2007 is actually coming true now, where I'm going to be around other wounded warriors, and I'm going to do what I can to do to help them get through their injuries like I got through my injuries and like the Marine that helped me out. Um, along along with that, from then till now, I've really taken a liking into uh, doing events, obstacle courses, marathons. I've done six Marine Corps marathons and five half marathons and three Spartan races. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like learning to do, like learning, like like Duke said, I, you know, you can consider me a, a wounded warrior. You can consider me not having any legs. I'm blind, whatever. It's who I am. You know, I'm going to get out and do what I can do. And it, it might be difficult, but I'm going to do it. And, uh, you know, I work with a guy. He guides me through marathons. We've ran people over. We've ran into things. And I broke a guy's arm. So it's a, <laughs> it's a challenge, but we've got it done. And in 2011, um, if y'all want to, y'all can check it out. It's on YouTube, 16 Minutes, went over to Iraq with us. And on this trip, Operation Proper Exit, I realized then that what I joined the Marine Corps to do was to deploy, deploy, deploy. And I can't do that no more. I'm starting a family. I'm starting school. And it's, it's, it's time to kind of close that chapter in the Marine Corps. I can still share my story and inspire others in a suit and not in dress blues. But, but you know, it's time to do it differently now. You know, my... my uh, for the longest time, when I first started, I, you know, I was a little nervous with going to school. I always stole, you know, my math sergeant, which him and my wife really, you know, paved that road for me. But I was nervous. I, you know, it was, it was a new, something new. And like Tony said, we're not used to failing. And, um, you know, he, and I kept telling him, I was like, when I'm done with the Marine Corps, then I'll go back to school. And he was like, no, you're not doing it. And he's a math sergeant. I was a corporal. So, of course, you can listen to him. He got the number of the disability coordinator in North Carolina. And, uh. You know, I, I talked with her, I sat down, I took two summer classes and I got two A's. And I was like, okay, well, here we go, you know, and of course class get a little bit harder. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, that was in 2011 and then in May, you know, I walk this May, <laughs> even though, you know, it's, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a journey, you know, first of all, I, I never thought I'd be going back to school. But now, you know, growing up in Winchester here, I am going to UK, a dream school of mine. And, you know, that was, you know, when I was getting out of the Marine Corps, my wife looked at me and said, well, you know, let's go back to Kentucky. This is a school that you always wanted to go to. And, you know, so here I am now. But, you know, I've, I've had wonderful teachers. I've had wonderful professors. And, um, you know, one of them I do want is uh, Miss Barber, who's in here. Where are we at? No. Math teacher when I was at BCTC. You know, I sat down and talked to her, you know, one-on-one. -on -one, and I told her that, you know, for, for my wife, math was a struggle. And we had to do it on... Is it my math lab? Is that? And Miss Barbara would sit down and talk to me, you know, go over the homework, go over notes. She would work it out for me. And even on the final exam, you know, and said it like we couldn't make it to class or campus at BCTC. And she drove out to my house and sat in my study and we worked on the final exam. And it's just like things like that has happened, you know, throughout my time of going to school. You know, I'm so quick at the beginning of the semesters to reach out to the professor to introduce myself because. You know, although you give them an accommodation letter, it's, it, I feel like it's, it's more coming from, from my mouth than an accommodation letter. 
Tony used to walk me to class, but I, I don't know. He gave up on me. I don't know. He's, but, uh, but you know, Tony. I'm not Tony, doing marathons, brother. I can't keep up with you. <laughs> I just thought you were going to get rid of me, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I started at UK in 2014, and the, my biggest worry here is this campus is a lot bigger than BCTC, if you haven't noticed. I'm blind, and I have no legs, and my wife had to do it for one semester, and um, you know, I'd go to class at 9.30, I'd be there for an hour and a half, and then I had like a, where she walked around Commonwealth Stadium with, at that time, my uh, under a year old daughter, she'd wait on me, and then, you know, I'd go eat, we'd go eat lunch, and I'd come back from the class, and she'd do it all over again. So she pretty much, you know, had her day set around my school schedule. And if anything, for you married people, happy wife, happy life, you know? <laughs> so, I, I, you know, and I felt so bad that she had to do that, but you know, she loved me and she wanted me to go to school. You know, she was always there if I needed, if I ever thought to myself, I was like, oh gosh, I got a bad grade, I'm failing, I want to just drop out. I can't do this no more. She was always there to give me positivity and a good kind word. But uh, coming to the UK, you know, we sat down with Tony. Um, Tony talked to us like that. He was like, Amanda, you get him here. We'll pick a destination, we'll pick a location, drop him off, and we will take care of him from there. And, um, it made it so much easier. I'd get dropped off right in front of Barker Hall. I'd go to my class, and when the day is over or my classes are done, they'd drop me off there, and Amanda would be waiting there. Um, you know, and then Tony, uh, I guess, what, two uh, uh, you know, ne next semester, worked with Kentucky Federal Credit Union and other organizations to go out and purchase a golf cart. Because we're we were relying on the National Guard's golf cart, which was being used to go to Subway every afternoon for lunch, <laughs> and then uh, the the cat's golf cart. So we didn't even know if we were gonna have a golf cart that day. But Tony went out and got a golf cart. You know, uh, you know, got it purchased. You know, for the Veterans Resource Center and the Wounded Warriors, so I can get around campus. And he made it so much easier. And I will say, school is so much easier when it's less stressful. You know, when you can't handle those, when you got to handle all those things, and you know, you're worried about your wife and your daughter walking out in the February temp cold temperatures, you know, it's just, you know, and now it's, I could go to class, I could do my homework, I can come home. But, you know, during all that time, I also had to relearn, you know, in 2008, I went to the blind school and it was difficult because I didn't pay much. I learned the computer, I learned the basics of how to send an email, but I didn't learn about how to view the internet, how to send out or write documents and type documents. And, for my wife who has a grade at, or checked over many of my papers, she could tell the difference from what it was like in 2011 to now. But, you know, it's the hardest thing is to kind of stay, you know, I have difficulties getting on Canvas or Blackboard when it was here on my JAWS computer. You know, PDFs bring problems. But, you know, I, I've talked to all the professors. I work with the professors and, you know, they're already busy enough, but they take time out of their day to send me Word documents where I could save on my computer and I could read them. And it's, uh, you know, uh, it's just things like that. You know, when I was at the BCTC, I had a professor that, the, the Disability Center, um, I don't like talking bad about people, but uh, <laughs> if, you're, if you ever go out to the Lee Town campus when it was there, it was like, what, three or four buildings, and there was a big hill in the middle of it, and they thought it'd be a smart idea to just, oh, you know, give Matt his long cane and let him walk down this steep hill across the street into a parking lot, and there's his classroom. <laughs> but the professor I had then, um, she was she told Amanda and I she's like here let me be your advisor you know Cooper would be a better campus for you and I'm going to find some classes and I'm also going to pick classes in the same location where you're not walking all over the campus and she was also one of the professors that would walk with me a couple of times I've had it here at UK where you know the work studies that Tony provides me aren't there on time then the professor will walk me where I need to go or you know we could wait on the work studies and I've had a really good relationship with all the professors here on UK, and that's the one thing that, you know, it's, I could say I love this university because I love the basketball team and football team, but now experiencing for the last three years and uh, dealing with Tony, the VRC, the professors, just the work studies, the people that have been there to help me get through and get that diploma, um, I guess in August now, but, uh, you know, to help me walk in May has been one of the greatest, you know, things of my life. I never thought I'd enjoy going back to school because, uh, you know, now I was set on the join the military, so I didn't really pay much attention to school in high school. Bare minimal military work, you know? <laughs> but uh, I've I, I really loved it here. You know, I've, I've learned to work through everything I, I, I can. And, you know, I've always thought, you know, and I said it from day one, anything you can do, I can do. 
and I've never backed down from that decision. And you know, me coming back to school, it's like I'm, I consider myself, you know, the same as any other student here. You know, I I am a veteran. I like to tend to sit alone sometimes or stay quiet. But uh, you know, it's just it's who I am, and it's something that I, that's got me through this. Um, uh, you have any questions? <laughs> I don't talk too long. I, I didn't talk as long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. We have time. We have time for maybe two or three questions. Does they, we, we can take questions from anyone here in the room, and we can take questions from online too. So, if a person has a question online, they can type their question in the chat box. Questions for Matthew, Tony, or Duke? There was a question. Let's not be shy. L. Sanford online. If you'd like to hear it. Then I, I think he says there's a question online. Oh, okay. Can you hear that? You ask your question, then I'll read it. No, go ahead. I can translate, Dave. Are you ready? Are you ready? When yeah. returning, uh, L. Sanford asked, when returning from duty and entering higher education, what might be the fields of interest that veterans could apply service knowledge towards a successful degree and career outcome? And I think that was directed to the lieutenant colonel. <clears throat> Return yeah, I think the question was what specific the academic programs that veterans might be attracted to. Um, that's a good question. It's actually a question we get penalized on when we do the friendly vet surveys all the time because UK doesn't really have any academic <laughs> programs designed for veterans. There are a lot of schools out there that try to design academic programs for veterans, but I would warn you that. Uh, oftentimes they're going after your GI Bill money uh, more than they might have concern for you. So I'd just be leery of that. Um, <clears throat> a lot of veterans tend to gravitate to law enforcement, so they look for criminal justice or they look for degrees that will put them in law enforcement. Um, history. history <laughs> my good history man here. Um, a lot of times it's MOS specific too or what they did in the military that might have a, a direct correlation to an academic uh, the degree program. Uh, a lot of veterans tend to like business because they think, okay, I was a natural born leader and manager, so business might be a good fit. So really, it's interesting if you look at UK's demographics, we're all over the map. So we have maybe 40 or 50 in engineering, that's mainly because the Navy called them engineers for some reason, and uh, they think they're engineers. Uh, but we have 40 or 50 or so that will go gravitate to engineering. We'll have um, <laughs> Some in social work that want to go, they've had some positive experience in their transition and they want to help other veterans. Uh, education and teaching uh, draws some as well. Uh, forestry, actually, we're uh, the only forestry program in Kentucky, but forestry is drawing a lot of veterans uh, uh, recently. And I can see that. It's, uh, it's outdoor oriented and uh, may feel very comfortable to some veterans. So to answer your question, I don't think there's a magic bullet, so to speak. I don't think there's a magic major out there. What I try to do is link veterans skill sets up with their major so that they find a major that meets their aptitudes and what they're good at doing because if you're going after money and picking a major based on that you're probably going to be sad hope that answered the question no i i wait and ask it you privately right? it's very simple. <clears throat> okay okay so i don't think anybody else okay well we have another, we have one more online question. Are you getting challenges from veteran students' perspective of college based on their experience taking online classes while on active duty? I'm not sure I understood that, but. Uh, are, are you getting challenges from veteran students' perspective of college based on their experience taking online classes while on active duty? Okay, so for the University of Kentucky's part, we do not have a lot of online options. So when I get an active duty phone call, uh, I normally, I'll turn off the mic here for the boss, but I normally tell them to look for another school because we are not the best with online education that a student could follow up throughout their military career. So um, when, when students, in on, on, when military and active duty want to take online classes, I normally direct them to strong brick and mortar institutions who have online options. That's what I normally do, because if they have a good reputation with DOD, like University of Maryland, for example, is, is a great example, uh, 
that you can rest assured that every class you take and every credit you earn will be uh, credited and valuable at the next institution. And that's what I try to, try to promote. Um, I, have, I have three quick announcements to close us. The first announcement is we have plaques for each of our presenters. We've got one for Tony Dotson. We've got one for Duke Pettit as well. We've got one for Matthew Bradford. Um, two, two other quick announcements. Uh, first one is we're going to do a raffle um, after the seminar today and draw five names from a list of the participants, including the fifth participants online. So we're going to have them in the raffle. We're going to um, it's the raffle to win a lap a lap gear my desk, which is a laptop desk you can um, sit on while you work on your laptop. Mm -hmm. You do not have to be present to win, um, and you will receive an email from Lisa Dunkley, who um, if you won. The uh, plaques and the raffle um, is the hard work of Lisa Dunkley, who's a rehabilitation counseling PhD student here at the University of Kentucky. And the fi final announcement, um, please join us for a reception afterwards. Um, it is upstairs on the first floor um, at, at the double doors as you came in. It's an opportunity to one, meet our presenters, two, ask specific questions, and three, continue to engage with student veterans. Um, if you're pressed for time and you just have to run out and leave, um, I would uh, encourage you to grab a sandwich from Stella's Kentucky Deli on the way out. If, if you're pressed for time and you just want to go, grab a sandwich and um, you can go. You have, you have I have free stuff, but I'm starting with the math teacher because I want, well, number one, I always want to give something to a math teacher. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'll, I'll hand these out to the reception, just not to hold up folks. I, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your attention. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. For coming. Thank you.